Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So, as we were discussing last class, there are three units in this paper this semester. So, the first one was E. M. Foster's aspects of the novel. So, we discussed uh, each chapter of this text very, very briefly, and we were uh, towards the end of this unit, unit one. So, uh, we discussed how E. M. Foster discusses story and plot. The importance of characters uh, in a novel and fantasy and prophecy, as well as uh, pattern and rhythm. So, uh, Foster claims that pattern and rhythm define the novel's aesthetic quality. So, the beauty of the novel. The arc of the story is essential to the narrative and influences the pattern. So where the story is going, where each character's story or his or her arc is going, it's very important uh, to the narrative. A novel's overall cohesion is an example of a pattern. Rhythm, on the other hand, is more subtle and challenging to identify. So rhythm is more challenging to identify that where has the author used uh, rhythm in the novel as compared to pattern. Uh, because the novel needs to be cohesive. So uh, it needs to make sense. The entire narrative or the story or the plot of the novel needs to make sense as together, uh, as chapters or as uh, parts Foster classifies rhythms as easy or difficult. One way for a novelist to establish rhythm is through recurring phrases or images with minor alterations, which can be symbols as well. So uh, if a character is saying a phrase many times in the novel or uh, is using an image or is referencing to something repeatedly, so that is a rhythm. The result is uh, like an echo or a memory due to repetition. Like a musical symphony, the work's existence grows as, as its various parts come together in perfect harmony. Uh, so various parts, prophecy, uh, rhythm, pattern, story, plot, character, which uh, we remember that Foster refers to as people in the novel and not just characters because they're real people. That the author's imagination has uh, created. Ian Foster's aspects of the novel is conversational in tone, which makes it reading, uh, reading it so exciting. So that's why it's very, it's a very simple read. So I encourage everybody to read the full text. Yes. So the novel as a reflection of society, literary narratives reflect the cultural norms and values of the society in which the narrative is contextualized. So what environment the novel is written in? What is the setting? What is the time period? Uh, what is the Plain, whether it's a space novel or whether it's on earth, uh, land, sea, just as a minor, uh, just as a mirror reflects, it can be said that a novel also reflects the society it is representing. So it's like a, uh, it's showing the mirror to the society and the people and points out all the disadvantages, drawbacks in a society. However, the comparison is problematic as often novels are also a critique of society. So we are criticizing society, highlighting the bad points and also showing a mirror to the society that this is how we are. We should do better or sometimes uh, or we are good doing good and offer us a better version of the world than the one existing. Factual details are often the raw materials of fiction, but they are necessarily not what fiction is all about. From the earliest times, recording culture has been an endeavor of humankind such as cave paintings so whatever is happening around us however we are evolving that's been a norm it's a tradition that every human society and humankind has always recorded culture how we are developing and when writing took form as a means of expression creativity knew no bounds as poets dramatists and novelists flooded the literary world with abstract philosophical ideas realistic depictions of the existing world and utopian or imaginative representations of society as it should be. So utopia is a perfect place or the other meaning is also an imaginary place. So a perfect society uh, can be offered through a novel which we strive for, uh, which inspires us to be better people or be a better society. And of course, uh, it said that the literary uh, creativity knew no bounds once writing took uh, form as a means of expression. So when writing was no longer there, uh, when writing was not there, because writing needs script. Every language begins with speaking orally. There are so many languages today which don't have a script. So you don't have written literature in those languages. 
once there is a script only then you only you can write so writing comes later cave paintings painting or uh, talking or speaking or poetry that is recited is oral but their writing and documentation comes later so once writing took form as a means of expression multiple uh, creative expressions uh, began socio political historical and cultural concerns have always been the purview of literature all writers poets dramatists novelists and essays essays who write essays reflect the values and mores of their time and place in their work in overt and recognizable ways so they also reflect society uh, in whatever form they choose they can choose it to write through a play or a poem or a novel autobiography biography essays so they reflect the values and the culture that time for example when we look at the novel anand math by bankim chand chatterjee we discuss that it contains uh, the national song uh, vande mataram it not only tells us about the society of then bengal when the sanyasis rebelled to gain back freedom from their motherland but also shows how the inhuman governance had caused many hardships for ordinary people during the bengal famine of 1770s so it's sort of an uprising re- revolting against the british government the society of those times is reflected through the fictional narrative though the events narrated in the novel are based on historical truths so suppose think of this as suppose titanic so titanic is a real historical event titanic was a ship that drowned on its first journey or voyage but the love story that happens in titanic is not real that's a fictional but they have chosen to uh, at the backdrop they have taken a real life event and they have cho- chosen to tell a love story through that real life factual event deep fiction is not history but it is no less than history to understand the society and culture of that period so through that uh, a fictional story we also come to know what were the attitudes or qualities or values or ethics of that period an author is a product of his or her age and knowingly or unknowingly he she represents society so then some authors do it consciously some do it without knowing when e m foster was writing there was a debate about how far realism or fantasy could be taken to decode the seriousness of a novel at the same time henry james in the art of fiction emphasizes that detachment objectivity and seriousness should be taken as a criterion for judging the worth of a novel and that a novel should be a, like history in the sense that it should provide an illusion of portraying reality as if it is portraying portraying reality even though it can be fiction so henry james is another uh, novelist uh, of the 19th century and he's also a critic and his the art of fiction is one of the most important texts for novel writers especially who are interested in writing fiction uh if this is one of the views of looking at literature that if uh, novels or fiction if, uh, illusion is an illusion of portraying reality then the other was that of looking at fantasy and imagination as the key to poetic creativity where the poets novelists dramatists aspire to create a better world than the world in which they lived so that fantasy suppose harry potter so that you can escape reality reality is not good but you create a world which is better and where you can go to sometimes it is not better but it provides a temporary escape from the real world uh shelley the famous pv shelley the famous romantic poet spoke about poets as the unacknowledged legislators of the world so if on the one hand people spoke in terms of realism as a mode of writing a novel then on the other hand others thought that fantasy is equally justified in portraying the society as one writes a literary text one should one is not just copying the world as it is or it was but also trying to portray the world as it should be so the future so maybe a novel is portraying a society which is much much better it's almost like a utopia a perfect society with a perfect human beings everybody is at peace so that's what we are striving for so that you give the people that uh, you know each day try to be better it is thus evident that literature reflects the society that we live in as authors are products of this world so they also come from this world they are writing in it and they are writing about it they necessarily portray or critique the reality they live in uh, so portray they just just uh, depict it as it is or they 
critique it they criticize it or appreciate it so critique means both appreciation or criticizing novels as narratives also do the same whereas the realist writer tends to look at the uglier aspects of society and portray them with a commitment to purge to release the society of those undesirable elements the fantastical writers try to take the readers to an imaginary world through their narratives to manifest to them a better world than the world they inhabit this both the bright and shadowy sides of reality find expression in literary narratives making them social products where the culture of the time is primarily reflected so uh, poets are and authors are the unacknowledged legis- legislators of the world because they try to make the world better not through law not through legality not through court systems or by being advocates or attorneys or uh, lawyers but that's why they are unacknowledged but by portraying society so socially okay not in the sense legally so that's why they are unacknowledged uh, legis- legislators literature is the collective and individual voices that shape societies for the claims that literature accurately reflects and depicts communities it must encompass a wide range of cultural practices philosophical tenets and personal qualities literature's evocative vocabulary makes it possible to describe the customs of various human communities literature as defined by its cultural connotations provides information or context that is both fascinating and affluent so it's rich okay so the context is rich as well as fascinating you want to it's appealing you want to read the reader can better comprehend and describe the feeling by referencing literary works and vocabulary from those works literature can thus serve as a portal to the past transporting readers into the protagonist's thoughts and feelings at a specific time or can take the reader to a portal that one aspires to so the either the past or a future so suppose it's a novel about the indian freedom struggle or partition so you're going to the past with the characters but if it's a novel about um, india or the indian subcontinent or the world in uh, 2050 or in 3000 that's future okay yeah so reading a novel for aesthetic pleasure is different from reading a novel for academic purposes uh as students of literature we do not just read but also critically analyze literary texts we know the basic aspects of the novel what makes a novel why are novels written the way they are then we can in a, in a structured systematic manner progress with the task of interpretation and analysis foster lectures make literature students aware of the seven basic aspects we need to look into while reading a novel the novels ananmat and azadi are prescribed in this course and you need to read them from the perspective of em foster's theoretical premises on the genre of the novel so uh, all the aspects that em foster has mentioned are they there are they present in these two novels that will uh, come in unit 2 and 3 it is not that foster's seven aspects of looking at the novel are the only ones so many people have def- uh, defined how novels are written how they should be written foster's words are not the one true sort of gospel there are many other aspects to be considered while studying a novel but for someone who is a beginner it's a good text and it's a good text to analyze novels against yeah so now we go on to uh, bunkin chand chatterjee's ananmat so ananmat was serialized in bunkin chand uh, chatterjee's journal uh, bangadarshan from 1881 to 1882 so serialized means it was published in the journal chapter by chapter or episode by episode it was not published as a novel one together it was published as a book in 1882 after all the chapters or episodes uh, had been written the sanyasi revolt in bengal following the battle of plassey in 1757 inspired adhanmat's plot the novel setting is bhirbhum and most events in the novel occur inside the forest it is often thought to be the first political novel which brings to the fore the nationalist discourse so the first uh, first political novel in india ananmat is a narrative about the sanyasi rebellion against the muslim rulers and the british tax collectors both this revolt has not been celebrated as the first national movement historically because of the localized nature of its spread in certain parts of bengal in the 1770s during the bengal famine so it was celebrated as a national movement national political movement because it was only in certain parts of bengal so more like a regional movement 
The history textbooks generally celebrate the 17, uh, the 1857 Sepoy Mutiny uh, as the first Indian national movement to gain independence because of the scale of its spread across India. So you had uh, in 1857, uh, you had so many uh, nationalists, right? You had Lakshmi Bai uh, in the north, then you had in the south, then you had in west, east, all over India. That's why 1857 revolt is celebrated as the first national Indian movement. However, Chatterjee in the novel Anmant portrays how the sannyasis reeling as they were under the oppressive British regime, taxation and the famine with its consequent diseases and starvation of the then Bengal fought for the cause of India and its strategy narrative portrays the rebellion and its nationalist spirit, probably one of the earliest displays of Indian nationalism in modern times. Uh, so modernist sort of big, modernism begins uh, late 1800s so second half of 1800s it's second half of 19th century so a uh, famine is sukha there there is nothing to eat there is no rain and uh, uh, yeah so famine can be a cause of drought which is sukha and famine is what we call in hindi bukhmari so the oppressive regime very very uh, torturous regime of the british rulers and uh, who charged so much tax from the poor farmers, uh, irrespective of if the crop is growing, not growing, are the citizens, uh, ordinary human beings even earning anything, but they want their tax. So uh, that's what the novel portrays. The song Bande or Vande Matram from this novel later becomes our national song. It suggests the extent to which the novel is significant for critical study to understand the rise of Indian nationalism and how it relates to anti-colonial resistance. So revolting against the British. This unit on Anmat, therefore, will focus on nationalist discourse along with a particular emphasis on the song Vande Matra. So this unit will also delve into other aspects of the novel, the historical context of its writing, the times it was written in, what was the atmosphere. The historical backdrop, it is centered on the gendered paradigm of colonial discourse and other facets. So, uh, even though Indians were all ruled by the British that time, but what was the difference between women and men at that time? So the gender paradigm. It is advised that before reading the study, uh, you should read the novel. So I recommend all of you read the novel first. It's very interesting. So uh, Nankin Chandra Chatterjee is a Bengali poet, novelist, essayist, and is mostly known for writing the patriotic anthem, Bande Matram which was sung by liberation fighters in India and ultimately made into the country's national song. His father worked his way up the government ranks to become the deputy collector of uh, Midnapur and his family was devout. So they were uh, faithful, they were religious. He received his Bachelor of Arts in 1857 from Presidency College and subsequently went to study law. He followed in his father's footsteps and served as the government, served the government as a deputy collector and then a deputy magistrate before retiring in uh, 1891. Ankin is sometimes called the father of modern novels in India. Although he was not the first to pen Bengali novels, he did much to legitimize the novel as an essential form of Indian literature. Raj Mohan's wife was his first published work of fiction. It was likely a translation into English of a novelette that he wrote in Bengali. So a novelette is a very, very short novel. His first Bengali romance, uh, Durgesh Nandini was the first Bengali novel to be published in 1865. Chattopadhyay's first significant work, Kapal Kundala, was also his first major publication. So Chattopadhyay is Chatterjee. Okay, Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay is the same person as Bankim Chandra Chatterjee. Yeah. So uh, in Milanini, another romance by him, he makes his first attempt to place his plot in a broader historical framework. In the political book Anmat, Sanyasins, Brahmin ascetics or Brahmin Rishi and Munis lead an army against Indian Muslims working for the East India Company. Devi Chaudhurani, the next novel by Chattopadhyay, was released to the public in 1884. And it's again, uh, yeah, his last novel, work of fiction, Sita Ram, is about a Hindu ruler who rises against Muslim tyranny. Bankim, a religious nationalist, saw Bengal split between conservative reformers wedded to the past and liberal reformers who sought to imitate the West mindlessly. So who wanted to copy, who wanted to copy the Britishers 
uh, without any thinking, who just wanted to be like uh, modern or liberal and no respect for their own culture, so to say. Uh, so he was, Ban Ki-moon was religious as well and he was a patriot and nationalist as well. And if uh, there were the other group was conservative reformers. So people who are conservative, not at all progressive in their thinking, they are very orthodox, uh, not at all broad, old mind thinking. So uh, yeah, he thought that reforming Hinduism from the inside was the only way to make it strong and independent. Okay, uh, so famine strikes Bengal in 1771, the year that Ananmat was set in. So the novel is set in 1771, that's where it begins from. Famine has devastated Parchina and a young couple, Mahindra and Kalyani, decide to flee Calcutta. So they decide to leave because uh, there is no work, there is no food. Uh, how can they sustain? How can they live like this, their family? They set out on the journey together but get separated on the way. Kalyani, a housewife, must run through the forest with her baby, try to evade the manhunters who want to sell them off for food. So they want to uh, kill Kalyani and the baby because the husband is no longer there uh, because they got separated. So they want to sell both their uh, bodies and uh, kill them and sell them for food. That's how dire, that's how severe the situation is. After a harrowing chase, Kalyani is exhausted and passes out at the river bank. A Hindu monk discovers her and the baby. But before he could rescue them, the British soldiers take him into custody. So they take the British monk. The Britishers take the monk, uh, the sadhu, into custody because he is suspected of conspiring with other priests, other sadhus, to incite a rebellion against the British rule. As he is being taken away, he notices a priest who is not dressed like him. The first priest... Uh, sends the message of the lady lying unconscious through a song. Kalani and the baby are rescued by the other priest. So before getting arrested, he notifies the other priest that there is a lady who is unconscious. So the other priest uh, decodes the song and leads them to a rebel priest's hideout. The priest also provides sanctuary to Kalani's husband Mahindra and the couple is reunited. Mahindra is keen to join the brotherhood of monks. So he's also uh, wanting to be part of their rebellion and join the sadhus or the sannyasis. The rebel leader takes him to see three different manifestations of Bharat Mata in the form of a goddess housed in three separate rooms. The three idols represent what mother was, an idol of goddess Jagarthi, uh, Jagarthi. The mother has become an idol of goddess Kali, what mother will be, an idol of goddess Durga. The three uh, manifestations or interpretations of Bharat Mata. Over time, the rebel movement gained traction and found more disciples ready to fight for the mother's honor, Bharat Mata's honor. They are then confident enough to relocate to a small brick fort. The British sent an overwhelming force to assault the fort. So to torture them, to kill them, to hurt them, the rebels blocked the bridge over the nearby river without artillery or military training. So they are trying to not get hurt without any military training. They are fighting against soldiers who are trained. Okay. The British make a strategic withdrawal across the bridge during the fighting. The Sanyasi army leads the British into a trap. As soon as the rebels flood the bridge, the British artillery pounces, killing dozens. Rebels take control of several cannons and begin firing at the British lines. After the initial victory, uh, so cannons are took. Okay, the rebels force the rebels forces at the British to retreat. Uh, so they are forced to retreat. They are forced to uh, come back. They can't fight the rebels. Mahindra and Kalyani rebuild their house, and Mahindra keeps fighting for the rebels. Now, uh, critically, we will analyze it. Bankim Chandra strategy, besides being a genius in imaginative literature was certainly the most powerful intellect produced by India in the 19th century. So this is by a quote by another author, Niraj C. Chaudhary. Panki never clamored for place of power but did his work in silence for love of his work even as nature does. And just because he had no aim but to give out the best that was in him, he was able to create a language, a literature and a nation. So he had no uh, 
uh, grand very big dreams of being the best author or being the best writer or writing india as such he just uh, did what he wanted and what he knew best and that's how he was able to create a language a literature and a nation so this is by sri aurobindo the indian philosopher and educationist uh, sri aurobindo is actually also one of the translators of anand bhat from bengali to english so there are a lot of translations of anand bhat available and uh, sri aurobindo's translation is the one which is used the most out of all the translations uh, or at least one of the most used translations adversity leads to courageous acts when determination is high adversity is the famine which leads to uh, kalyani and mahendra joining the rebellion courage and determination mold character to go beyond selfish pursuits and attain greater good for the community and often for the nation when famine and consequent starvation and diseases force people to even think of eating human flesh as we saw the man hunters who are running behind kalyani and her baby the sanyasis of bengal showed extraordinary courage to fight the misgovernance free their motherland and establish a right over their own resources the government officials relentlessly and cruelly taxed people even when the villagers were dying of starvation and diseases due to famine the people of bengal left their personal interest to join the order of children of mother india even though the novel champions the spirit of nationalist ethos and dedication to fight and die for one's nation an individual's passionate desire to gratify sensual delight has also been the novel's subtext so even when you are working for the greater good or uh, being a nationalist and ready to die for one's nation uh, the novel also uh, prioritizes uh, the desire to gratify or satisfy your own sensual pleasures therefore if on the one hand adversity is caused by the famine serve as the backdrop of the novel the nationalist sentiment of the sanyasi which made many like uh, mahindranath leave their household and join the order of the mother is the other end whereas passionate desire is also part and parcel of the novel indranath is the full name of mahindra thus the novel anmat can be termed as providing a picture of the 1770s bengal however as it was written during the colonial period in the 1880s the political context of the novel is british colonialism so the famine is almost 100 years ago when the novel is actually being written it's set 100 years ago in many ways the novel champions the national spirit necessary to fight the colonial regime patriotism and nationalism one of the themes a minakshi mukherji uh, characterizes anandmat as one of the earliest political novels it is overtly political it's directly very on the surface political it's not like you are reading between the lines and then you find some uh, political themes it's like on the face political as it deals with the issue of nationalism at its core when muslims were ruling bengal and the british tax collectors were exploiting people the hindu sanyasis come forward to fight against the misgovernance that was aggravating the hardships of the people at a time when the famine had already made human beings suffer like never before so uh, people are already dying and starving because of the famine and then you are putting more taxes on them it is believed that bunking attempted to awaken the country to an idealistic romanticized regeneration of the hindu ethos uh so idealistic or romanticized very very glorified okay very very perfect idealistic bunking was one of the earliest to define the indian nation and to usher in a sense of nationalism among indians with his literary outputs bunking chand chatterjee and anmat and his works consciously tried to awaken bengalis if not the whole of india to the new idea of the nation which was necessary not just to drive away the foreign rulers the britishers but also to form a nation where veneration for the nation as a mother was necessary condition so veneration devotion and respect for the nation for your motherland was a necessary condition to get rid of the foreign or british rulers the nationalists in india later used bunkins veneration for the nation as a mother to successfully inspire the masses especially during the swadeshi movement and the later phases of intense confrontation with the british so which happened in 20th century so between mainly between uh, 1920 to 1947 the satyagraha and the swadeshi movement 
it can be said that in anand chatterji blended nationalism with religion by invoking an image of a goddess as mother india it worked wonders to inspire people to imagine the indian nation and come together to fight their colonial british so it's not just fight for the motherland or the land you were born in but also fight for the goddess so that's a confluence a combination of nationalism with religion this he puts forward certain tenets of militant nationalism in this context ashish nandi in his book the intimate enemy loss and recovery of self under colonialism argues that the modern colonial west try to define themselves as masculine and the colonized as feminine the one who is ruling uh, the other countries whether africa or asian countries try to define themselves as masculine so the father of the land and the colonized the people who are being ruled so that would be uh, indians or the indian subcontinents or in pakistan or the africans try to define themselves as feminine so you know love for the motherland whereas the west was fatherland the indians could not accept the feminine position ascribed to them and thus reacted with the masculine shatriya traits of indian culture as a reaction to the western binary so the binary is completely opposite things masculine and feminine a feminine the initial indian reaction was a celebration of indian masculinity the rise of militant nationalism was perhaps necessarily a direct response to western domination so because the west tried to define that uh, colonial colonized people the true people who they were ruling as feminine there was a reaction from the side of indians that we will define our own masculinity which will be revolting against you uh, that's how the rise of militant nationalism when you pick up arms and weapons for your nation okay now we come to the song vande matram which is perhaps the most known section of the book everybody has read or uh, has sung vande matram or knows it at least the song vande matram written by bankim chandra chatterjee as a part of the motivating song for the members of the order of children of mother india has become india's national song the song is included in the novel to ponder over its significance and the context of its composition and why was it composed the context in what environment or atmosphere was it composed reason for its composition people needed an image that would make concrete the idea of a nation as a mother ankim provided that desire that desired image what the people needed in the song so the song vande matram becomes crucial very very important in the novel the past grandeur of mother india is invoked and is set to contrast with the shameful misery that the motherland has been reduced to by exploiters so by the rulers both internal rulers within the country uh, who were uh, indians and uh, as well as the britishers so uh, the past grandeur the past grandness or the past glory of the country is tried to uh, bankim has tried to invoke this once glorious mother is now reduced to abject suffering extreme suffering poverty famines and begs her sons to restore the former splendor restore my former glory my honor bankim associates the mother with the concept of shakti which is mentioned in the song vande matram uh yeah so shak- shak- uh, shakti is female strength feminine the weapons she carries in her 10 arms her seemingly limitless strength and her razor sharp swords convey an impression of enormous power and strength in addition to having maternal and feminine traits this mother is also extremely violent and stimulating so she is not just soft and feminine and maternal she is that but she, she is not just that she also can be extremely vicious and extremely uh, invincible yet vulnerable when she needs to challenge her enemies the movement was paved with such a potent image creating strong feelings it is essential to see how bankim's perspective changes from patriotic concerns confronting the west to a more theocentric outlook which has not been adequately addressed theocentric is centered to religion okay so theology is the study of religion he seems engaged in promoting true hinduism in the later years of his creative life 
So from a nationalistic, there has been a shift to uh, theology. He set out to elevate nationalism to the status of religion because he realized how nebulous the feeling of nationalism was. Hinduism was viewed as an excellent way of life and patriotism was the highest religion. For instance, he was putting the earlier analogy between Krishna and Jesus through the earlier uh, comparison. He was fascinated with the comparison to the point of obsession, comparison of Krishna with Jesus. A thorough analysis of the well-known song Vande Matram is necessary because this is where Bankim's perspective on nationalism is best reflected. The song reiterates, it re-emphasizes the motherland's initial wealth and for, uh, fosters the image of Durga, the goddess known for defeating demons who begs her sons to restore that power. And Durga, of course, in the form also of Kali. Perhaps for the first time in Bengali literature, Bankim transformed a, a despicable region a very, very uh, pitiable region into a sacred place deserving of sacrifice and veneration. So, uh, your region which has a famine, uh, nobody can eat or earn or work, that region also deserves respect and honor. And it's holy, it's not uh, bad. The earth was transformed into a feminine ground of sustenance the other was a ferocious Hindu goddess. Because it successfully integrates nationalism and religious tropes, the book tropes its themes. So it successfully combines those two. The book quickly gained popularity outside Bengal. The Bhagavad Gita is credited for motivating nationalists in the early stages of the movement to carry a copy uh, of the Gita along with their pistols and the phrase Vande Matram. Uh, so the Bhagavad Gita is not credited, it's uh, Anandmat. Anandmat is credited for motivating nationalists in the early stages of the movement to carry a copy of the Gita along with their pistols and the phrase Vande Matram. The song is filled with a lot of em strong emotions. In addition, Bankim formalized the nation as a mother and employed the goddesses Durga and Kali to define the mother, combining two essential elements. Uh, this nation's Association with Durga will stoke religious feelings. This deification would have profound effect not only at the time, but can also witness its effect today. So it's like Agni uh, Ghidalna. Okay, so uh, giving rise to the fire. Suggests that nationalism has become an important uh, part, as important as religion and is effective in influencing the religiously inclined minds of the Indian populace, Indian people. It is also claimed to have released a previously untapped spiritual force, spiritual because of religion. Nationalism was a confession and a religion and not just something to think about or feel. The Mother India image was the clearest example of how nationalism in the 19th century was heavily influenced by religion. Bankim Pradhan Tattuji was a well-read man and he was very much influenced by the historical novels of Walter Scott, which made him write many historical, semi-historical novels. Now, uh, Walter Scott was also uh, an author who wrote in English, European, and very, very successful novels. One of the significant ones among them is Anand Mutt, which may, uh, he wrote because he was inspired by Walter Scott. To state that Anand Mutt is historically accurate would be an exaggeration. But as stated earlier, it was based on a historically accurate incident. So the time it was based in, uh, the rebellion and the, especially the famine are all accurate. But the story of Mahindra and Kalyani, uh, it's not accurate. It was based on the Sanyasi rebellion in the 1770s when Bengal, especially the district of Budwan, was going through a famine which had caused widespread devastation, a lot of poverty and hunger. Chatterjee's historical or semi-historical narratives were primarily inspired by the Scottish novelist Walter Scott's use of history to portray the state of the nation. Walter Scott has written many historical romances. Anandmat is a special one among them as it tries to fashion the Indian nation in the uh, image of Mother India and mold its future by ousting, by kicking out foreign rulers. In his famous, famous book, Benedict Anderson, so Benedict Anderson is one of the leading theorists, scholars and critics, he defines the nation as an imagined community whose manifesting needs to be there in the people's psyche. Because a uh, nation 
is not the same as country country exists on a map country is a geographical entity okay and if you have state state is again a political entity so state the indian state it's a legal political entity and country is a geographical entity that's the difference between nation and country nation is in our minds so how do i know if a person from south is indian and i'm also indian so that's an imagined community okay we have the same idea of nation in our mind uh, that we belong to the same nation bankim through the concrete image of the nation as the mother goddess was able to appeal to the people not just in bengal but across india the appeal was such that the future nationalist leaders took this image of mother india and could popularize it and instill in the hearts of millions of indians which ultimately paved the way for india's freedom uh, the sanasi rebellion against bengal's ruler Neil Jaffer and the British tax collectors inspired Anand Mat. The historical fight between children of Mother Earth and the Muslim king of Bengal, who controls but does not rule in concert with the British, is shown on the literary canvas. The socio-economic setting for the conflict is devastating famine that struck Bengal in 1770 and its aftermath. Low caste and those who lived in the forest started to eat dogs, mice, and cats. It's literally to the point that you eat anything that you find. Those who fled to unknown locations perished there, died there from starvation or dehydration, while those who stayed died of disease, either because they ate the uneatable, because you ate something poisonous or something you're not supposed to eat, or for want of any food at all. The novelist depicts the ruthlessness of the halves uh, of the halves during the crisis. So even in uh, uh, today's society, we have the haves and the have-nots. people who are privileged or underprivileged so people who have things who have food clothing and uh, shelter the basic necessities and the have nots people who don't have these things hunters and all of rural bengal provided the source material that bankim used for anand mat it is important to note that the work strictly does not adhere to history the emotion behind it however seems to embody bankim's vision a vision of a free india as tagore notes in his chat with murkraj anand so murkraj anand is also one of the uh, prominent novelists but he wrote during uh, 1930s so much later he was at the same time as uh, r k narayan and uh, uh, kanthapura's author this novel is a legend of the struggle for freedom raja rao so raja rao and uh, r k narayan and murkraj anand are known to be the holy trinity of indian english writing in the 20th century this novel is a legend of uh, the struggle for freedom to support his ascetic nationalist theme punkin uses this historical incident nonetheless the nationalist rhetoric is entirely his creation since the novel creates an alternative history of indian nationalism rather than just representing it because there are fictional elements to it it's not as it is representing it's creating also it is difficult to place it in the country's history of nationalism because it's also combined with religious factors banki was influenced by his socio cultural forces and he tried to reconstruct history in an apparent effort to free his contemporaries from their captivity and collective amnesia the story resonates with the historical past and the political issues that were highly important throughout banki's lifetime However, it pulls more from imaginary truths than factual reality. Okay, now issues of gender. One peculiarity, so one of the things that is strange of the images of women throughout history is that archetypes have reinforced social stereotypes. Archetypes are models, so uh, have reinforced social stereotypes. So archetypes, suppose uh, a homemaker or housewife archetype. women that would be represented in a certain way always in all the texts they reinforce social stereotypes so they reinforce gender roles or class and class caste roles another way of putting this would be to say that in every age no matter what time what era women have been seen primarily as mothers wives mistress sex object and their role about men how they can be used for the pleasure of men that's how they have been uh, seen throughout history Uh, not as fighters or nationalists or militant nationalists who are capable of going out and fighting 
Though the novel Anandmat is about patriotic sensibilities of the sannyasis of Bengal during the Bengal famine, yet when we look at the novel, it explores different aspects of the social order and how different communities are affected by the natural calamity as well as the nationalist fervor in different ways. So nationalist uh, passion. Women have been the worst victims of any calamity in a patriarchal order. Women are so patriarchal order in a male dominated society. Women are given a secondary status compared to men, but Bankim does not see women as secondary. In his realistic portrayal of society, he shows women to be sufferers. They suffer, but when it comes to nation building, Bankim believes that women have a similar role to play as men. In this context, it is crucial to understand how and why Bankim Chandra strategy represents the masculine and feminine in these terms in the novel. Indian society has traditionally been patriarchal, male dominated, where women are seen as subordinate to men. When the colonial West, Britishers arrived in India and other colonized nations, so whether Asia, Africa or Australia, they celebrated their masculinity in terms of their martial strength and looked at the Orient. So the Orient is the East, the people who were colonized. The Orient or the colonized as feminine Indians reacted to this male chauvinist viewpoint by celebrating their own masculinity as pointed out by Ashish Nandi in his book, uh, the same book, okay, Loss and Recovery of Self Under Colonialism. So, uh, when the Britishers came, they considered themselves to be masculine, superior, okay, and the colonized, the people they are about to rule as inferior, as the feminine. The initial reaction of the Indian writers to this patriarchal colonial homology was to celebrate instances and myths from Indian history and mythology to celebrate Indian masculinity in terms of Kshatriyahood, so the warrior. Nandi points out how Mahatma Gandhi later tried to question this colonial homology and looked at the humanitarian aspect as much more significant than the masculine feminine dichotomy. So because the Kshatriyas uh, were all uh, people who practiced uh, of the Kshatriya caste who went out and fought in the war were all males. So uh, people uh, when the, they were treated like that by Britishers Indians started celebrating their masculinity in terms of Kshatrihood. But Mahatma Gandhi pointed out that instead of looking at this masculine-feminine dichotomy, uh, this role, this uh, dilemma, you should look at the humanitarian aspect. However, before Gandhi could do so, Bankim Chatterjee was already celebrating the feminine in his portrayal of the nation in terms of the mother and all its sons to be her devotee. So Bankim takes the feminine to another level, something to be worshipped, okay? And all its sons and daughters to worship the mother. Because Bankim uh, came before Gandhi, because we're talking about uh, 19th century, uh, that is 1880s and 1890s, and Gandhi started writing and uh, protesting in the 1920s. Bankim Chatterjee significantly for his times pointed out that women have a more significant role to play in nation building than men. Though Bankim was a magistrate in the colonial administration, he wanted his writings to inspire the youth to come forward and join the order of the mother to free India uh, from the clutches of the oppressors, whether they be the Muslim rulers or the British tax collectors. Now the natural calamity, which is the famine, uh, natural calamities are common in the history of human civilization, uh, earthquakes, droughts, tsunamis. There has been constant effort to mitigate the devastating effects of the calamities and have the preparedness to deal with them. So uh, be ready, like you know, prevention is better than cure. In literary studies, the eco-critical academic engagement in recent decades has gone beyond profound veneration for nature to critically gauze and fathom how the anthropogenic ways and humans, so anthropogenic is anything to do with humans. That's what anthropo means. Anthropogenic ways and human selfishness has caused more harm to nature and humankind when men try to dominate nature instead of coexisting with other species in nature. As we see right now, the climate crisis. That's uh, what they mean by the eco-critical academic engagement. 
So environmental humanities, for example, is a field. Bankim Chandra Chatterjee's Ananda does not deal with the causes of natural calamity. The famine of Bengal works as a backdrop. The novel's first part portrays how famine had devastated village after village in Bengal. Mahendra and his wife decide to move to Kolkata from Padichina to save themselves from the onslaught of famine. So the famine was coming towards their town as well. This forced migration has not just occasions uh, the narrative but also becomes the cause that makes Mahindranath realize how he should dedicate his life for the greater good of the nation. Furthermore, natural calamities are also testing times for people. Communities either perish due to their selfishness during natural calamities, either every person is looking out for their own, just to feed their own family or their own stomach, or they fight together to reclaim what is lost during the calamity. If on the one hand, the Bengal famine led to the starvation of people to such an extent that they were ready to eat human flesh, which is cannibalism, eating humans, uh, humans eating humans, then on the other, the order of the children found its zeal and enthusiasm and courage to fight the colonial British tax collectors because the adversities had made them do so. The adversities, the difficult situation had made the courageous and conscientious people come together. So people who have a conscience, okay, who uh, want to fight for the greater good and establish a righteous nationalist order and stop the drain of wealth from the commoners because only the commoners were asked to keep paying taxes and even the taxes were being increased in such a difficult time. Calamities are also times when good governance should be at its best to use available resources equitably, equal distribution, so that the adverse effects of the calamities can be mitigated, they can be met or minimized in the best possible manner. Governments should take proactive steps and roles not just in saving citizens' lives, but also see that the concerns of the downtrodden, the most poor people, are taken care of. Due to the famine in 1770s, as represented in Anandmat, the colonial administration, along with the Muslim ruler of then Bengal, carried out its most authoritarian taxation regime that aggravated people suffering from starvation and dying from diseases, so which increased their suffering. So instead of uh, governing, nicely and uh, instead of practicing good governance they became even more authoritarian and exercised their authority like a dictator motivation for people to come together and join the order of the children to free their motherland came from the experienced suffering during the calamity same is true of Mahindra and his wife when the natural calamity made them come out from the comfort of their home and experience the people's insurmountable sufferings which sufferings which don't end. So they just keep on piling each other uh, on top of each other like a mountain, dedicated their lives for the nation's sake. Now the genre of the text and feature film. So Anmat is also a film. Uh, if you get time, you can watch it. The Anandmat is a novel, a more extended narrative dealing with the history of the Sanyasi rebellion. The novel has been translated many times uh, the two authentic ones are the most popular, are the ones translated by Sri Aurobindo, as we discussed previously, and the other by Lipna. There are two Bengali and two Hindi film adaptations of the book Anmat, directed by uh, Satish Das Gupta. The Bengali version was released in 1951. In 1952, Himan Gupta adapted the novel into the Hindi film uh, Anandmat, which starred Prithvi Raj Kapoor, Bharat Bhushan, Pradeep Kumar. Ajit and Gita Bali, so all these are legends of the Hindi cinema. Uh, Lata Mangeshkar's rendition of Mande Marath uh, in the film, uh, which has Prithvi Raj Kapoor, has become a fan favorite. Anandmat has caught the attention of filmmakers and others because not only it helps in understanding Indian nationalism, but has also shaped the Indian national sensibility. So what we think about our nation, okay, and how we relate to each other and the nation. We must remember that before the British came to India, Indians did not have a notion of nation as we know nation today. So we do not have the idea, notion of uh, the notion of nation, the idea of nation. What is it to be together? What is it to be one nation? Because there were different states, there were different rulers ruling different parts of India in different states. 
there were kingdoms whose boundaries and allegiances were never fixed so if you're fighting within ourselves also if you want to win a region or a state you kill the king there or you uh, fight the army however people living in india had a sense of belonging to their soil often people think about nations merely from a western point of view and believe that modern nations grew up with capitalism and the rise of colonialism however such a view of the nation has its limitations how india came together cannot be understood merely if one thinks of the nation from a western point of view so the west also think that uh, indians did not did not have an idea of what a nation is or what nation they belong to before the britishers uh, had to leave tagore in his lectures on nationalism had stated form yourself into a nation to stop the encroachment of the nation the second nation is capitalized okay so uh, emphasis on nation the idea of nation so form yourself into a nation to stop the encroachment of the nation so to stop anybody else from ruling you form yourself into a nation the western colonial powers approached the colonized as a nation and they so because uh, the british were already a nation okay so they had they knew where our boundary lies and who are the people who are part of as so called uh, you know england or united kingdom and they exercised political and cultural hegemony cultural dominance over the colonized which needed to be countered which needed to be opposed with a different idea of nation and nationalism bankim in his novel anandmat provided a counter discourse so an opposite perspective to colonialism uh yeah so we'll just sum up more than ever in today's context anandmat has become significant when many try to read the novel as a representation of the first nationalist discourse of hindu nationalism the sannyasis of bengal took up arms took up weapons to save car indians from the oppressors but their taking up of arms should not be seen as a justification of violence in the name of the nation the sannyasis took up arms because that was the only option available okay so you have no resources you have no work food uh, or the, any way to take care of your family uh, so that's the only option left that you have to take up arms because no uh, amount of begging or negotiation or discussion is working at unusual times the sannyasis found it justified to take up arms to rebel against the autocratic order to deliver justice autocratic is authoritarian and take control of the resources so that the commoners should could be saved anandmat remained a crucial text for the indian revolutionaries we must revisit read and reread the novel to figure out the context in which it is situated and in the context in which it is written to understand the actual manifestation of the national discourse it celebrates yeah uh, so benedict and anderson when he says that nation is an imagined community uh this is where he says it uh and then these are the recommended texts so i recommend that you all should uh, read the novel uh, both aspects of the novel and definitely anandmat and it's a very very simple read anandmat the translation it's not a very difficult words a very difficult uh, structure of the novel So in the next class we'll discuss Azadi by uh, Chaman Nahal. Uh, thank you everyone for joining.